Welcome to the Prado Museum in Madrid, Spain. We're here again on the Prado Social Media Programming with our Wednesday sessions in English. This is a program that's supported by members of American Friends of the Prado Museum. And we thank you all for your support. And we encourage everyone to find out about how the Amigos in Spain and the American Friends support this great museum. Today, we are in the classical sculpture galleries on the ground floor. And I'd like to just tell a little bit of the story of this central piece that draws our attention right when we come into these galleries and has fascinated people for centuries. It is called here the Sacrifice of Orestes and Pilates, or the San Ildefonso Group. And this is a work, a Roman sculpture from 10 BC. And what do we know, our first data that we have on this sculpture uh, is, from the six, is from 1623, if you'd like I'd move this way, 1623, a group of fragments of sculpture were offered to the Ludovici family in Rome. So we could imagine someone found fragments of this sculpture and 14, 15 fragments and offered it to the art collectors that were the Ludovici family and who purchased them and had them restored or put together by a famous, very famous restorer at the moment, at the time he was called Hippolito Guzzi. And as I was researching this, Hippolito Guzzi also put together the statue that's famous in the Anglo-Saxon art history, which is the, the dying Gaul. So the same, at the same time they're finding the pieces of the dying Gaul, they found the pieces of this group of sculptures, they put them together. And this sculpture called a group, first of all, it, it draws our attention because it's more than one figure. There's lots of classical sculpture that's one figure. Here we have an element of figures, which is very uh, attention grabbing. This sculpture uh, put together, it did not, there were pieces that were missing, the feet were missing, the one arm on each hand was missing, the head on the left hand side is also a later addition. So the main, the main structure was be able to put together and then there were some additions at the time. From the Ludovici collection, um, in the 17th century, it passed to another collection and then was offered and bought as the first sculpture in the collection of Christina of Sweden. So Christina of Sweden was the abdicated queen of Sweden who had turned Catholic and had moved to Rome where she um, lived the rest of her life and she was a great art collector. And this was the first sculpture that she purchased. And we know this, uh, their data that her art um, advisor uh, suggested that she buy this sculpture to keep it in Rome because the other person who might buy it was the Spanish ambassador to Rome, the Marquis of Carpio, and so they were afraid that maybe it would leave Rome. And by this time, travelers to Rome, this work was so famous that it was written up saying, when you go to Rome, what you have to see is this group of sculptures. And it was very impactful throughout uh, Europe. There were copies, people wanted other, um, Le Poussin, the artist, made a drawing of it. There were engravings. Uh, Louis XIV commissioned a copy made for Versailles. Catherine the Great of Russia uh, wanted a plaster, pa plaster cast of the work. And why was it so impressive? It's impressive because in one piece, you could see the development, the history of classical Greek, Greek sculpture. So in one hand, it has this figure in the, in the background, which is an archaic image where the figure is absolutely rigid and straight. Then we move to this first figure uh, of these two youths. We haven't talked about that they're two youths together. And, this was also always considered the epitome of friendship. Friendship to the death is what we will find out. Um, but it, this figure here is in the development of classical Greek sculpture, includes kind of the polycletus, first contraposto, the move where one leg is bent 
and there's a slight curve. So we're going from rigid to the first contrapposto, and this would have come from 5th century BC Greek sculpture Polycletus. This is a Roman copy 500 years later, but it's including the progress of classical Greek sculpture. And then the figure on the left would go even further, and this is 4th century BC influence from the school of Praxiteles. We've heard a lot about the Praxiteles curve, where the hip is even further out and there's more of an S in the body. So these figures, so, the, so this group was fascinating because it had all of this eclectic uh, styles in the progress of, of classical group sculpture. We see these two youths that are joined together, support, you know, hanging on to each other, and they're making, they're lighting an altar sacrifice. Now the modern scholars, when they look at this and they say, when is this, uh, eclectic group of sculptures put together, thanks to the altar, they recognize that this is first century BC, and so this is from when we, we date the original classical sculpture. Now, from Christina of Sweden's um, collection, the kings of Spain eventually purchase almost all of her collection after she passes away and it comes up for auction. It goes through uh, a few other collections before it reaches the Queen of Spain, which is Isabella of Farnese and Philip V. And this is why it gets this very strange name called San Ildefonso Group. San Ildefonso is a palace that these king and queen of Spain made on the outskirts of Madrid. It's one of the royal sites, and it's a beautiful palace that if, in, if you haven't visited, when you visit Spain, you need to visit it. And it was decorated with all of the classical sculptures that they brought from Rome for this place. And so kind of for safety purposes, the historians afterwards called this group the San Ildefonso group because they really didn't know who these two youths were. They could, they've been uh, attributed to Greek consuls who were willing to be sacrificed for, the, uh, for Rome, uh, Castor and Pollux, and other figures, even sleep and death. But the latest studies give us the idea that this is Orestes and Pylades. And Orestes and Pylades is from Greek tragedy, Orestes is the son of Agamemnon, who figures from the Trojan War. Agamemnon is murdered by his wife and his wife's leather, lover, and Orestes as his son with his very good lifelong friend Pylades avenges his father's death by killing Clytemnestra, his mother. But because he avenges his death, he is also pursued by the Furies. He's tortured uh, mentally. And so Apollo says, to free you of these tortures, you must go rescue the sacred image of Artemisa that is in Taurus, which is, this is, um, the source here is from Greek tragedy from Euripides. This ancient image from Taurus, which is nowadays Crimea, and bring it back, and this will cleanse you of your suffering of having avenged your father. So, this is what we believe today. But then to add the context of why this is made in the 10th century BC, which is the time of Augustus Caesar in Rome, is that there's a political reading into it that Augustus Caesar, the son, adopted son of Julius Caesar, identifies himself with Orestes, who avenges his father's death, Agamemnon, and Augustus Caesar is avenging the death of Julius Caesar by giving death to Cassius and Brutus. And that brings it all together and gives us the meaning of this gorgeous group of sculptures and helps us approach it today. So the mythology, the art history of it, the, its importance throughout Europe, how it reaches here the, to the Prado, it all comes together, and so with more context, we enjoy it a lot more. So thank you very much for listening today, and we'll see you again next week.